Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, when some people think of gardens, they think of back-breaking work, but gardens can be places of relaxation and enjoyment. Right after this, we'll take a look at gardens for work and play. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, I find the older I get, the more I'm looking for ways to make gardening a bit easier. And I have to say, I'm looking for ways to make my garden much more inviting and more beautiful for family and friends. If you're like me, you probably get out on a Saturday and work and pull things together, and then on Sunday, kick back and relax. Well, in today's show, I thought we'd talk about creating beautiful outdoor living spaces and give you a few tips on how to make it easier on yourself. We'll look at ways to blur the lines between inside and out and create fantastic and low maintenance outdoor living spaces. Find out about these whimsical topiaries. We'll take a look at some space saving fruit trees that are easy to maintain and still produce fruit. And I'll give you some time saving tips in the garden, like how to keep your tools sharp and handy, when you should prune and when you shouldn't, and how to keep bugs at bay during an outdoor gathering. Up next, a visit to a North Carolina retreat. So stay with us. Whenever I have the opportunity to help someone create a garden home, it's important for me to get to know that person, to understand their sense of style and their taste and the way they live in the space. I want the exterior, the garden, the garden rooms we create, to reflect the architecture of the home as well as its interiors. For instance, this home is a mountain retreat done in the rustic style. The exterior is covered with tulip poplar bark, it's decorated with rustic bits of trellis, and it's just meant to be a relaxed place, a place where friends can come and just kick back and enjoy time together. An aspect of this home that I really enjoy is the outdoor living room. I worked with the homeowner to make this space more inviting. What we did is take advantage of the outdoor fireplace and create a sitting area around it, complete with a sofa, chairs and a table, lamps and accessories. The fabric on the pillows is weather resistant, so it's going to last for a long time. You know, a covered porch, deck, or patio can easily be turned into a simple outdoor garden room by adding some furnishings. This is a low maintenance way to enjoy the outdoors. Now this home is high in the mountains of North Carolina, but let me show you another example of an outdoor living space, only this one is in coastal California. Here we have a condo with a deck that faces a golf course. Planter boxes were used to establish a sense of enclosure, creating the walls of the room, if you will. And as you can see, the outdoor furnishings are big and comfortable. The addition of garden ornament and this handsome green pottery full of sedums adds a touch of style. What a perfect place to kick back and enjoy a sunset. Now, sometimes, in order to enjoy the luxuries of life, we have to give up on style. We've all seen it with pools or hot tubs. Sometimes they can be unsightly. But what I encourage my design clients to do is embrace these elements and turn them into positives. For instance, creating poolside retreats, turning a hot tub into a pavilion. Outdoor living spaces not only expand your home's square footage, but they're also a nice way to bring your lifestyle outdoors with minimal efforts. Now, once you have a structure like this in place, it's just a matter of updating container plants and maintaining trees and shrubs in your flower beds. Now, coming up a little later, We'll take a look at a recipe for enjoying the outdoors, as well as some tips on entertaining outside. But next, we're going to take a look at color in the garden, pressed flowers and topiaries inspired by travels abroad. Stick around for this one, folks. It's a fantastic story. So much inspiration can come from the garden. Maybe that's just one of the reasons artists are always drawn to its beauty. One art form that I really admire is that of pressed flowers. It's great because you can pick and preserve the flowers in the spring and summer and use them year round, even in the middle of winter or on rainy days. And that's exactly what pressed flower artist Thaley Cullander does when she creates these impressive works of art. 
This is a flower press. It's just two pieces of plywood with toggle bolts on. You just put them on this paper that helps absorb the moisture and let them, let them dry for about two weeks. I see this, this piece right here and already I can see now, I can already start having a feel for um, designing. I'll take my little piece of fern and I'll get one of my little, one of my little roses and maybe add a little handsy to it. And you've got to have a little, a little squiggle coming out. Now the next step is after I've designed this, I'll start gluing and then when you're through, you have to always put your name on it. Bailey makes beautiful and inspiring cards using pressed flowers, but these cards, well, just take a look at them. They're larger than life replicas of postcards that George W. Vanderbilt sent back home to Biltmore during his travels abroad. These cards served as inspiration for a topiary exhibit that's just about as colorful and whimsical as you can get. There are a lot of exotics in these beds, including some from India, like that Exora. We've tried to, to take plants from the countries that we're representing in this topiary show, put them around the topiaries, put them around those vignettes so that get a peop a people could have a feel of what it was that George Vanderbilt saw or felt when he was visiting those countries back in the 18 and 19. I see. So the topiary exhibit you have going on now really speaks to his travels and, it, and where he went exploring. It, it does, and one of the, the neat things about it, he sent postcards to people, and sometimes he sent postcards to himself, I guess to remind himself of where he had been. <laughs> so we've picked up that part of the, the central theme is using the postcards and then placing them along with a topiary figure in a garden setting. Well, and this is perfect for this particular garden. Well, we love this elephant. Yeah, well, I mean, the elephant is fantastic and it just represents so many exotic plants. Plus, of course, India was one of the colonies of Great Britain. And they collected plants from India and they went all over the world, but England especially wanted those plants badly. Yeah, they were really into oh, it, yeah. weren't they? Well, I see here you've got some really fun things going on. There are cannas punctuating the four corners and that wonderful coleus called tilt -a -whirl. It's one of my favorites. It, it does real well for us. It, it'll take the sun. Well, that's what's great about these new coleus varieties. They really are better in the sun. They do. The, the colors jump out more. They're brighter. Well, if you're into big color, Victorian garden design would be maybe a, an area of study for you. It, it would be how to paint those big broad brushes of color on the ground. Well, you all are doing such a great job well, here. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Oh, wonderful. Glad you could make it. You can certainly take inspiration from that topiary exhibit and apply it to your own garden. You see, topiaries can be made by forming chicken wire into shapes and allowing an evergreen to grow into the form. As the plant begins to emerge through the form, you can easily clip it so it conforms to the shape of the wire. Now, I promised you some time-saving tips that'll help keep your garden in tip-top shape. Up next, I'll share those with you, so stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm Alan Smith. In today's show, we're talking about work and play in the garden. We all want to minimize the work and enjoy the garden more. Earlier we saw how several of my design clients have created outdoor living spaces that give them easy and comfortable retreats in their own backyards. The plantings are minimal, but the effects are great. Who wouldn't want to kick their feet up and enjoy the sights and sounds of nature? We also saw how a pressed flower artist brings the garden indoors by creating these masterpieces and how the Biltmore Estate took inspiration from historic postcards for these fun topiaries. As you can see, they've really taken pleasure in the whimsical. Now, in my garden, particularly in the spring and fall, when the weather's nice, the place to be is outdoors. I look for every opportunity to spend time in my garden, inviting friends and family. But you know, when summer rolls around, so do the mosquitoes. And I'm always looking for ways to keep them at bay so they don't run me inside the house. And one of the ways I do that is I use citronella oil and I just fill these tiki torches with it and light them and they create a beautiful atmosphere in the garden and keep the mosquitoes at bay. As an oil, it's long been prized for its fragrance and insect repelling qualities. You know, citronella is one way to make your garden more enjoyable. And I found if you'll keep several jugs of this oil on hand, it'll save you time and headaches later on. Now, another way to save time in the garden is to just keep up with where your tools are. I know that sounds simple, but I'm constantly leaving my tools here and there throughout the garden. I think you know what I'm talking about. Several years ago, I started keeping my tools in a galvanized pail like this. 
Now, it's just a simple device, but all I do is take the pail, fill it with sand and mineral oil, and then I bring my loppers and shears and just stick them down in here. One of the great things about this idea is the oil keeps water from damaging the metal. And of course, the coarseness of the sand serves as, well, like a sandpaper-like substance. It keeps debris off the tools. So as you can see, by caring for your tools in this way, you not only save time, but money. Now, one of the things that I do in the fall and winter is try to get into my garden and clean it up. And it's about a lot more than just tidying up the garden. I find that if I'll do a few things along the way, it makes a big impact in the garden in the spring. For instance, plants like the morning glory, which can be spectacular in the garden in July and August, but they're ready to drop their seeds in early fall. As I remove the spent vines, I make sure that I shake them so the seeds will fall onto the ground, so I'll have more blooms like this next year. I also do this with other plants in my garden throughout the year. Now, there are things you don't want to come back in the garden, like diseases and pests. If you find problem areas, take them out, but don't put this material in the compost bin. Say it's leaves from your roses and you had a problem with powdery mildew or black spot. By placing these in your compost bin, you're just going to harbor the disease for your garden till next year. Now, when it comes to pruners, if I've been pruning on diseased wood or leaves, I'll take them and dip them in a household disinfectant before I use them again. Now, let's tackle pruning. Well, as you can see, it's haircut time again for many of my evergreens. You know, there's just something invigorating about taking a pair of sharp shears and whipping these shrubs back into shape. I'm just removing these little tall radical stems. I've had these boxwood in my garden for about eight years, and I trim them like this two times a year, once now and then later in midsummer, and they thrive from this kind of treatment. Now, boxwood are a broadleaf evergreen, and other plants in this category include hollies, azaleas, and rhododendrons. You can see they're aptly named because they're green throughout the year, and the leaves are broad, broad as opposed to needle-like, as you can see in evergreens like spruce, pine, or juniper. These two types of evergreens recover differently after being pruned. You see, broadleaf evergreens have dormant buds on their stems. So when you cut a broadleaf evergreen back to these bare stems, what happens is the dormant buds are activated and they soon flush the plant with lots of new green growth. On the other hand, if you try to take a needle type evergreen like this Leyland cypress and cut it back to the bare twigs, don't expect it to flush with new growth. You see, all of its new growth buds are found in the green foliage. So if you're pruning some of these needle-type evergreens, you may want to take a little lighter hand because you don't want to end up with a plant that's too leggy and can't recover. This Allen's Mailbox segment is brought to you by Marvin Windows and Doors, where our premier made-to-order windows and doors help open your home to the garden. Learn more at marvin.com. In today's show, we're taking a look at saving time and resources in the garden. But what about saving space? You know, there are some trees that can actually save you space. And I have a viewer question here that relates to this. This letter comes from Mary in New York, and she writes, Alan, I'd like some fruit trees. The other day I caught the end of one of your reports where I think you were talking about miniature trees. Is there really such a thing, or was I hearing what I wanted to hear? Well, Mary, what you were hearing is true. There are smaller varieties of fruit trees to consider. I've been able to grow about six apple trees in my tiny vegetable garden because they're columnar apples. These trees are four years old and only eight feet tall and two feet wide. I planted them six feet apart, which created a stately sense of rhythm along the back of the fence. I purchased two of each of these varieties to ensure good pollination. If I tried to plant even one standard apple tree, it would have grown to dominate the entire garden. But with these tall and vertical varieties, six of them can fit beautifully into my small garden plant. A good time to plant fruit trees is February, so keep that in mind if you're considering trying columnar apples like mine. When you have a question about plants, garden design, or if you're just looking for a new way to use fresh from the garden ingredients, be sure to visit pallensmith.com. Not only do we have an incredible search engine, but also a free weekly newsletter chalked full of great tidbits, including my answers to viewer questions. Now that we've gotten a few time, money, and space saving tips for the garden, let's turn our attention to outdoor entertaining. Up next, a tasty chicken dish that's perfect for your next dinner party. There are just some herbs I can't imagine being without in the kitchen, and garlic is one of them. It's just amazing what a few cloves of this plant can do for food. With fresh garlic available to us any time of year, 
It just makes sense to take advantage of its great flavor in many ways. One way I like to use a number of these cloves is with one of my favorite chicken recipes, roasted chicken with garlic. For this recipe, I started by cutting two young fryers into pieces and peeling 40 cloves of garlic. For a little additional flavor, I use about two cups of chopped celery. Now I'm ready to mix together one cup of dry white wine, a half a cup of olive oil, and a tablespoon of poultry seasoning and stir. I always like to use fresh parsley and basil when it's available. I'll mix this together and drizzle it with a spoon over the chicken. As a final touch, I'll squeeze the juice of a lemon over the chicken, sprinkle some salt and lemon pepper on it, and then cover it with foil. I'll bake it in the oven for 45 minutes to an hour at 375. They say the flavor of garlic never lets you down, and this recipe is certainly proof of that. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you found some things that will inspire you to work less and enjoy your garden more. Sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile